So let's check out section 2-4 quadratic functions. So again, a little refresher, and then examples will help us refresh on all this. Um, so quadratics look like this, ax squared plus bx plus c, right? Quadratics have an x squared term, um, right? They make that parabola shape. We were looking at that with transformations a lot, right? They might be upside down, but they make parabolas. Um, right, all those transformations from the earlier chapter sections, um, the A in front is what stretches or compresses it. So when A is bigger than one, it's like, st it's stretched, it's like steeper, right? When A is less than one, it's compressed. So it just looks like shorter and fatter in a way. Um, the negative makes it go upside down. So... Same graph, but upside down. And then the bx plus c is what makes it shift. So it's not an immediate horizontal and vertical shift. We'll have to check that out in a second. But those are what causes the shifts. So we'll have to maybe rewrite it to figure out those shifts exactly. But just makes, makes it move left and right. So without bx plus c, it stays at the center. Um, so the vertex, we can see in the graph below. We'll figure out how to find it in a second. We call it HK, it's like the lowest point, um, or for an upside down graph, it's the highest point. Um, it's a peak, and then it'll always be symmetric about the vertex. So whatever that X value is, it's symmetric about that, right? I could fold that line and the graph would be the same. So let's figure out how to find the vertex. We may or may not have seen this before. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite ax squared plus bx in this new form, um, a times x minus h squared plus k. And you can kind of see the vertical and horizontal transformations better there. And so that's why the vertex shifts from 0, 0 to hk, right? The X's shift to H and the Y's shift to K. But let's figure out how to figure out what H and K are, right? We haven't seen these letters before. So I'm going to do everyone's favorite thing completing the square. So to complete the square, if A has a if X squared has a constant, you have to factor that out. It may have been a while since we've seen that. So I factor A out. So B divided by A times a will bring me back to b, so that's why that becomes that. And then completing the square, what we're gonna do is we're going to divide this value by two. Right, we divide b, it's b over two. So in this case, my b is b over a over two, which is b over two a. So when I factor, it'll be x plus b over two a squared. That's what this value always becomes that. And then what I want to do is I want to square that value, and that's what I'm adding and subtracting. So b squared over 2, oops, over 4a squared. So plus b squared over 4a squared. And then if I add it, I have to also subtract it. Right? We can't just add a number. So we're adding it to make a perfect square. So these first three terms are going to make the perfect square. And then we have to just get rid of that, factor it out, take it out. Um, I'll link some review of completing the square in case we have no memory of this. But we did do this back in chapter one as well. But this one's a little tricky because it's not numbers. But the rule is, is we always divide. So it'll be b over 2 and then add and subtract. This is a short summary, b over two squared, and then my perfect square is x plus b over two squared, and then you'll have some extra stuff. So I will add a summary, um, I'll add a video so you can actually watch the full process in case we don't remember. So here's my perfect square. So I'm going to keep the a with that, and then I'm going to distribute the a to this one to get it out of the perfect square. So we get minus a times b squared over 4a squared plus c. 
And so my perfect square turns into x plus b over 2a squared. You can check that. b over 2a times b over 2a gives me b squared over 4a squared. And then the middle term would be this, right? b over 2a plus b over 2a will bring me to b over a. And so we get a is x plus b over 2a, and then we just get this mess. And then who really cares what this mess is? If you want to make it one fraction, um, oops, we can simplify it, but we're going to actually ignore this in a second. So 1a goes away. We get b squared over 4a, so then we could do c over 4a, c over 4a. You'll notice it looks kind of familiar, but we're actually going to, I'm going to give you a shortcut. And then if you hate this, you never have to do this again. <laughs> so we'll get 4ac, and so we'll get b squared, um, negative b squared plus 4ac um, all over 4a. So I'm going to just make it a little bit clear. I'll make this a plus sign and put a negative on the b squared. So it kind of looks like something we've seen in the quadratic formula. But again, we're gonna, that would be my k. Um, so my h is negative b over 2a, because it's x minus h. Here's my k, um, but we're gonna do a shortcut. So it turns out that h is negative b over 2a, that's the x value of my vertex. And then rather than memorizing this, it should make sense that y is just f of x, so we can just plug that in, negative b over 2a. So we did all this crazy completing square just to get a formula for the vertex. So now we can just jump to this. So the vertex will always be negative b over 2a, comma f of negative b over 2a. So I did all that crazy math and probably stressed you out just to give us a shortcut formula that we can just jump into now. So the whole point of all this is just to convince you, right? You shouldn't believe everything I tell you. Um, and to maybe prove the answer a little bit, but now we can jump to the shortcut. So negative b over 2a is just this b and this a. So we'll find the vertex in a couple examples. Um, a few more refreshers, and then we'll do examples. So um, we have the y-intercept of 0c. That's always true, right? Because if I plug in 0 the first two terms disappear. The x-intercepts come from the quadratic formula, right? Because it's when the equation equals zero. So if it factors nicely, you can do that or jump into the quadratic formula. So write this down if you don't remember it. It's a good formula to know. And then the discriminant is the number inside the square root, and that tells me how many solutions. So when that number is positive, we have two solutions. When that number is zero, we had only one solution, and that's because basically this piece disappears. And then when it's negative, right, we have no solutions because the square root is imaginary. Because we get imaginary numbers. And so how does that affect the x-intercepts? So when it's greater than zero, we'll get a graph that crosses twice two x-intercepts. When it equals zero, that'll be like just one intercept. It's going to make it touch. Happens to be the vertex as well because it's the only way to have one. And when it's less than zero, we'll just get a graph that's like shifted and doesn't cross the x-axis. So it's possible to not have x-intercepts. So let's try one example in this video since we've done so many definitions and we're probably a little overwhelmed a lot of information um, that we may not remember at all or maybe we've never seen. So it might be a lot. So hopefully examples can help clarify some of this information. So let's deal with all those definitions I just told you. So let's start with um, a quadratic. We'll find intercepts, vertex, and then graph. And those three pieces should be enough to graph the function. So let's start with intercepts. Uh, I'm gonna do the y-intercept first because it's easier. It just means x equals 0. So f of 0, we just plug in 0. 
I do this one first because it's easier. And we notice it'll match the C value. So 0, negative 5 is my y-intercept. Right, we could probably do that without plugging in, right? It's always C. My x-intercepts are when we set it equal to 0, negative 2x squared plus 4x minus 5 equals 0. I don't think this factors. You can try. Um, but if it doesn't look like it's easy to factor, I just jump to the quadratic formula. So x equals negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. There's YouTube songs if you want to try to memorize this. <laughs> They're really annoying, so you will memorize it. Um, so let's plug in. a is negative 2, b is 4, and c is negative 5. So we get negative 4 plus or minus b squared, 4 squared, minus 4a, negative 2, c, negative 5, all over 2 times negative 2. So we're going to get negative 4 plus or minus 16, and then we get negative 40, all over negative 4. Um, 16 minus 40, what's that? It's negative, so that'll be significant. Uh, 24, negative 24. So that goes back to the discriminant I was just talking about. So because this is negative, what does that mean? It means we have imaginary solutions, which means we have no x-intercepts. It's going to fit this category. Imaginary means no real solution, so no x-intercepts. So we don't need to solve this anymore. All right, so we're going to have a graph above the x-axis. Um, it's going to go through 0, negative 5. And I think if we have the vertex, that should be enough to graph. Um, sorry, above or below. It can be below. We could also have one down here, right? It just doesn't cross the x-axis. So let's find the vertex. So the trick for the vertex, in case you'd never seen, we did all that crazy work, but it's actually pretty easy. Um, so deriving it was tricky, but this now that we have this formula, it's actually quick. So we're just going to find negative b over 2a. So b is 4, a is negative 2. So negative 4 over 2 times negative 2, which is 1. So x equals 1 is the x value of my vertex. And then the y value, we just plug that in. So I know I made it look really scary, but right, it's a lot easier than all that crazy stuff we did. So we're going to go ahead and plug in 1 to the function, so we get negative 2 times 1 squared, we get 4 times 1 plus or minus 5, so negative 2 plus 4 minus 5, I think I get negative 3, so 1 negative 3 is my vertex. So 1, negative 3 is right here. And then I think we also had 0, negative 5 was my intercept. And then one more thing. Um, so because a is negative, that means the graph opens down rather than up. So it's an upside down parabola. And so we can sketch this, right? There we go. That's enough information to sketch it. We know it can't go up because it has no x-intercepts, and it also doesn't go up because a is negative. And so that is my parabola. So let's find domain and range and take a little break. So domain, remember, is x values, right, numbers we can plug in. And for parabolas, for quadratics, the domain is all real numbers. 
right? There's no like restricted values. There's no denominator that can't be zero. There's no square root. So for quadratics, it'll be all real numbers. I can plug in any X. You can also do negative infinity to infinity. And then range is not intuitive. Um, range, just by looking at the function, we don't know the range. Um, the range is the output, right? What y values are possible. So this is why we need the graph. Um, the graph tells me that the y values are not all real numbers. If you look up here, right, none of those y values are happening. So we're just going to use the graph to see that the largest y is 3, negative 3 from the vertex, and it's anything smaller. So y is negative 3 or smaller from the graph. So without the graph, I cannot answer this. And so in interval notation, that's negative infinity up to negative 3, and we will include negative 3. So to find range of a quadratic, we need the graph. But domain will always be all real numbers. So let me know if you have questions. We have a few more quadratics, and then we'll be done with this section.